Welcome to Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn. And I'm Chris Noble. And we're on a journey to explore the brightest and most innovative minds and initiatives in social purpose. Today, companies and brands must stand for something meaningful. They have to have a social purpose and bring that purpose forward to their employees, their customers, and their community. Each episode, we're talking to leaders at Fortune 100 companies, global brands, social enterprise startups, NGOs, and everything in between. We'll be taking a deep dive to learn how they are integrating purpose into their organizations. To benefit both business and society for enduring impact. Join us. Welcome to Purpose 360, and I am so excited today because I have one of my favorite people in the world um, that's joining us, Paul Lindley. And Paul has a, has a very interesting background. He's a CPA by training. He was with KPMG for five years. Then he moved on to Nickelodeon in the UK where he was a deputy managing director and he was there for about nine years and then he left to start Ella's Kitchen. Uh, Today now the UK's largest organic baby food company and Paul's going to share with us his journey because he is an entrepreneur that built a company with purpose at the center. So many of our interviews are about how you take purpose and how you convince your colleagues at a company to join in, to bring their capabilities and their resources. That wasn't the case with Paul. Paul started it at the very beginning. He's also a big supporter of the B Corp movement, and Ella's is a B Corp. He also has other interests now um, that he sold Ella's, and we're going to talk about that. So, Paul, welcome to the show, and um, I, I'm just so thrilled to have you. Hi, Carol. Thank you so much. Um, you've certainly done your research there. I didn't recognize myself for a minute, but uh, all true. It must mean I'm getting, I'm getting too old. Oh, no, no, no. Because at your heart, you understand all of the learnings from a toddler. And we're going to talk about your book um, a little bit called Little Wins, The Huge Power of Thinking Like a Toddler. Um, You'll never forget that great creativity. But I'm just curious, you know, you grew up in Zambia. Um, You, you know, took the accounting track. How does someone mesh all of these wonderful education and curiosity to become the founder of the UK's largest organic baby food company. <laughs> yeah, I ask myself that sometimes. You know, I, I don't know. I, I, I've been blessed and cursed with, the, with having both the sort of maths and logical and sort of um, that side of the brain uh, way of looking at life, but also a creative um, way. And, and so I've ebbed and flowed between creativity and between sort of uh, numbers and logic and, and the business side of things. And that's really helped me make, make the best use of my skills when I, when I became an entrepreneur, um, which was in my mid-30s. But until that point, you know, I'd either done CPA stuff, which was uh, very um, right side of the brain. Okay, so... Let's talk about the that moment when you were sitting in your kitchen and Ella was very young. And where did that germ of the idea for Ella's Kitchen come from? Well, that's that's right. Um, you know, the whole company is named after uh, my daughter, and, and I think you know so much of, of success in life is due to um, adapting and building on your own experiences um, and. You know, I'd got to a point in my life where, as you said, as a CPA, so I was um, very strong and comfortable with business plans. But um, I had an idea. I'd worked for Nickelodeon for a long time. I'd seen that brand being um, a fantastic advocate for for children first. Um, And I had also come across a lot of uh, the statistics and the, the information around how our children are getting less healthy by generation every single year because um, and it was seen that television was being blamed for it. So sitting at Nickelodeon, 
I got a whole insight into kids' health, uh, kids' development, and I sort of put a few things together. I'd got a business experience. I built a brand at Nickelodeon in the UK. I had an idea of building a food brand that, like Nickelodeon, was all kids first, but for a parent's point of view, was, was healthy, organic, nothing added, uh, and, and helped the weaning process. And I was at a time of life where I thought, if I don't do this, I could regret watching somebody else do something similar, and that would be a lot worse than trying and failing. And so I wrote my resignation letter from Nickelodeon. I took a deep breath, and I plowed in um, to uh, create Ella's Kitchen. So that, that was it, really. It was seeing my daughter, having the experience of my daughter and her weaning journey for the first uh, couple of years of her life. Um, coupled with the professional experience I had at Nickelodeon of how to build a brand where you put children right at the heart of it, put them first, and build everything around them. Um, so Ella's Kitchen, biggest baby food company in, in the UK and in 40 countries around the world. Uh, it's got a great footprint in the United States. But that all stemmed from this desire to improve children's health by developing healthier relationships with food um, that we felt our brand could do. And that became the mission of the company. That became the reason I wrote that resignation letter. And the trick then was to create a sustainable business that could use its profits to um, help make that change and improve those children's lives. And it's fascinating that it wasn't just about selling baby food. It was something much larger. You were very clear about your purpose from the beginning. And um, I, I love that in your book, little wins, you talked about your son, Patty, and you were trying to what name your first product or what was the first product? And and he said, the red one, red like my fire engine. Can you tell us about that story? Well, really, it's a great uh, example of how we should listen to both children and our inner child in our head, I think. And it's the, 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 the premise of my book, but it's the true story behind Ella's Kitchen. Kids have really great ideas. You know, kids, uh, uh, toddlers aged between three and, and five or six, um, have this view of life that is full of imagination, full of self-confidence, full of free thinking and honesty and ambition and determination. Um, and th- I, I, I argue that we should grow down more to think like that again. And I give in my book some examples of businesses that have grown directly because of children's thinking. And I can talk about uh, the Mr. Men books, which came from a, a child's idea. I can talk about Polaroid cameras, which came from another child's idea. Uh, and I can talk about Ella's Kitchen and the way that we named our very first product, the red one, because a four-year-old little boy, my son, uh, that's what he automatically uh, pointed to when I asked him which his favorite was. And that little bit of insight meant that we called it that. It became our bestseller. It's still our bestseller. And it really... Uh, resonates, you know, really true in business terms, thinking about your consumer first um, and listening to them. But in a much wider sense, um, it's that joy I feel and the little boy inside of me that says, yes, we should, you know, that innocence and that free thinking and uh, imagination the children have can be so relevant to the way we find solutions to the problems in business and our personal lives and much bigger in society. The the, the solutions are there. We choose to conform. We choose to play by the rules too much and do things because the person before us did them just like that. And children don't think like that at all. So that's the kind of allegory around why naming the product the red one, because a four-year-old boy, my son, called it that, uh, really works. You have taken fun and innovation and delight to the highest levels from your packaging, it's so colorful, it's squeezy packs, to your um, your advocacy, your veg for victory um, with Xander and the Baby C News, and we're going to put a link to so many of your videos um, with the with our on our website, so people can really see the 360 degrees of Paul Lindley and Ella's Kitchen. But can you talk about um, the importance of not only the advocacy and why that helps to build a purpose brand, but also the branding of it, because um, they're all intertwined. Um, yeah, I can. I can, and perhaps best to explain that by by broadening it about a, a little bit of that. And 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 
you know, where, why I started my own business is because I had an idea that I thought society could benefit from in that we found, I found a way that I thought children could eat better, therefore be healthier, therefore be happier, therefore contribute to our society better as adults and, and kind of win-win. That's, that's, and, and when you think about it, that comes down to me as to why we exist to improve the world for our children. Now, if you take any business then, in that context, the point of business must be to improve society. The point of anyone buying anything from any business, whether it's a cup, a cup of coffee or whether it's a, 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 a big airliner or, 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 or whatever, then um, it, people only buy because they think it's going to improve their life. The heart of business is people. It's not money. That's my fundamental belief. And understanding what motivates people to invest in you or to work for you or to buy from you is the trick to a successful business. Of course, and with my CPA hat, I would think of this, you, you need to have a sustainable business model. But business models, any action plan are delivered by people. And if you're an investor, you look at the business plan and you think, OK, that's a business plan that could work. Are these the people that can make it work? When you apply for a job in a company, you must be thinking, yes, there's a salary there, but I'm spending six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours a day with these people at this company delivering a mission that, and a purpose that may hopefully overlap with my own vision in life. I want to enjoy myself. I want to you know, want to be at this work. And your question was really about brand, Ellis Kitchen as a brand, but I, I'm sort of saying any brand starts from the inside and works out you can't just say okay we're going to say to the external world we're going to do an advert we're going to try and persuade people who want to buy from us that we stand for this this and this and it will improve their lives by this this and this and therefore they should buy it we've got to live that it's not it's not authentic it won't it won't work unless we're living those values and those those, that that brand value internally in our culture and in the environment that we work in and therefore, that's all to do with people. So building a business with a people-centered approach, the money follows that, um, and, uh, and you get trust, and you can build prosperity, and you can do good with that prosperity. We certainly understand that, that the employee today is so, so important. They're your life's blood. So, so thank you for, for really um, focusing on that. Um, advocacy is also part of the success of Ella's. Can you talk a little bit about um, Veg for Victory and averting a recipe for disaster and why it's important to create an ecosystem around the product and your purpose? Yeah. Um, and the, the, the short answer is that one word trust. It builds trust. It, 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 one, it's the right thing to do. And secondly, it builds trust. Uh, and it, it, if we are true to our vision and mission of improving children's lives by developing healthy relationships with food, we can take a very narrow view of that and say, OK, we can create great products that we'll ask people to pay for. And we can take, a, or we can take a wider view and say we can create, great, create great products. People will pay for them. We'll make some profits, and with those profits, we can reach other people who can't or um, don't have the opportunity to to buy our products, and we can make a bigger impact. And that's where advocacy comes in. We have got the trust of our consumers. We've got the credibility of our position in the industry and in families' lives to be trusted. And we've got, I believe we, uh, as businesses like that, have a responsibility then to act and, uh, and to use that credibility for good. Um, and I think it's morally that's the right thing you've got to do if you want a better society. But I also think it's in the economic best interest of brands that, are, that are, can show that they are fulfilling their mission and their purpose by something that's wider than just selling their products or services. And so, you, you, Paul, you created the greener paper that you presented to the NHS. Can you talk about that? I want to put it in the context that, you know, I founded Alice Kitchen, extremely proud of that. I ran it for uh, eight years. I was chairman for four years, and I stood back, and I'm not involved in the, in the company at all um, for the last six months. Um, so when I say we, I'm not technically involved in the, in the business anymore. My heart is my my head and my uh, and any sort of contractual relationship isn't but 
what I'm so relieved and grateful and proud of is that the vision that I had for the company um, has flowed through with successor as CEO and the management team now. I think it's the easiest to explain by saying our mission is to improve children's lives and develop healthy relationships with food. We can easily do that with the products that we create and sell and make um, a margin on and make profits from. Then what do we do? Then as we built that credibility that we had, we had opportunities to uh, use the insight and the research and the trust that we had to nudge our government in the United Kingdom, to judge our food industry as a, as a leader within the industry, to get some of our competitors and our colleagues to, to go with us to try and push for changes um, through things like uh, uh, bringing together roundtables of experts to create a report called Averting a Recipe for Disaster, which we uh, then took, I took to uh, the UK politicians, uh, had it discussed in the House of Commons, uh, had it discussed extensively in the, uh, in the press in the UK, um, and had some of its ideas, which were recommendations for, for all of society, government, big government, small government, the food industry, parents, um, children themselves, as to how we can avert the recipe for disaster, which was in the UK, if nothing else changes, by 2050, half of the children born now will be o- overweight or obese. And that is a serious um uh, has serious consequences for our, our society and our economy. Um, we followed that up by uh, by taking some of those recommendations and implementing them as pilots uh, in uh, one city in the UK, uh, Leicester, uh, where we said, "Look, these are our theory ideas. Now we're putting them into practice." There is, a, you know, a relatively small amount of budget we've put in as a relatively small company. Government, now you can see what the impact of this has been. And you can scale this across across our country. And there's two or three things that the political parties um, in the UK adopted in their manifestos um, for from recent general elections on the results of, of some of the things that we could amplify through the pilot that we did. Um, you talked about Veg for Victory. You know, our experience um, uh, in uh, in commissioning research, but in commissioning a review of all existing research for the last 20 or 30 years, um, uh, looked at ve- how children are introduced to vegetables when they first start weaning. And, you know, uh, without getting technical, there's a, there's a golden opportunity between six months and one year where all children at that babies of that age will accept anything food that they've given eventually. Um, uh, uh, and uh, so it's persistence from, from parents that are needed to, with vegetables um, to to get their, their kids to, to, to want to eat them. But once they do, they'll have a lifetime of, of eating them and they, they, they have much less chance of becoming fussy eaters. So we did a whole campaign, including our own products for just vegetables products for, for babies, um, of which nobody else did, only vegetables ones. But we also went to our government again in the UK uh, and the National Health Service that we've got and uh, tried to persuade them to change their uh, their guidance for for weaning for for through um, our health service to 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 promote vegetables uh, earlier in life. My name is Zander Van, reporting live for BBC News. Here I am opposite the House of Parliament in London. It seems the city has been taken over by delicious vegetables. Little ones are taken to enormous building blocks made out of all sorts of scrawny veggies to government, and they say veg first. The little ones want to give something to the very important people at the Department of Health. It's Ella's Kitchen's Greener Paper, and it's all about giving little ones lots of yummy vegetables during weaning. Stay right there. I'm going to investigate to find out more. Um, And, and, you know, we've got a... a, uh, We we did that privately and sort of one-to-one with with decision-makers, but we also did it publicly with our consumers um, through products, but also through uh, the touch points that we have. For, so, for example, our Veg for Victory campaign in uh, on on YouTube and through social media reached millions of people, uh, mm-hmm. and there's some very uh, uh, clever and funny videos uh, around um, Winston Churchill or Winston Churchill, as we call him in our videos, and um, his famous speeches, uh, which we uh, which we sold a serious message um, with with fun and humour um, to uh, over a million people. 
Winners of the free world, tea time is upon us, and I say nothing but veg. Not just today, or tomorrow, but for a whole two weeks. And when our tummies are full, the nation will say, this was their finest tea time. Veg for victory. Yeah, I mean, you're creative, and I just urge listeners to watch these uh, videos. Uh, I love it when you're being interviewed um, by Xander, um, who, who's how old, six or seven, and you've got you've got a broccoli as your microphone, and you go veg first, veg frequently, veg, um, veg in variety, which I think is and Weinstein Churchill hysterical. So uh, the, the creative is fantastic. So the company grew. It doubled and tripled in sales every year. What, what was the impetus to um, seek a sale? Um, to, and eventually that was Haynes Celestial in 2013. That's a very intimate decision for an entrepreneur. Yes, and a very risky one and one that you could regret the rest of your life or the one that um, could be the thing that changes your life. And and for me, um, it, it came about, funny enough, through through our business in the United States. You know, um, we did extremely well in the UK. We've done extremely well in the in, in Europe, the mainland Europe. Um, and we were courted by some of the major retailers in the United States to, 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 to come and set up an operation in the US. Um, and we did that and we grew. Um, and, um, you know, the, U- the U.S., obviously a huge market, obviously a complicated market in size, logistics, legislation, and um, uh, uh, and highly entrepreneurial and fast moving. So we found that we were um, uh, in, in a competitive situation with others that had been inspired by what we were doing, had their own ideas and were growing very fast with with significant investment behind them. Um, and. You know, we, we began to think, you know, that these guys, our competitors are fully focused on the U.S. We are dedicated to the U.S. and, and uh, you know, had set up a whole company and, and production and infrastructure and, and were U.S. based. But we had op- operations in the rest of the world. And as a very small company, you know, not taking an eye off the U.S. Um, market when our competitors had two eyes on the U.S. market became something that mm-hmm. I began to think a lot about. And I, I, I thought we need a U.S. Uh, you know, a, a big partner um, to to be able to compete, um, and, and that's fundamentally why uh, I, why I sold the company. I, I sought somebody that could protect um, our U.S. market, that could add to um, the opportunities we have to further scale our businesses, but crucially, um, that thought about the world in the same way and, and could protect the mission and build and scale the mission as well as the the profits um, within the company, and I found that within Home Celestial. And how? And for the our listeners who may be at that size where they need that next um, jump, uh, how did you pick Hain Celestial? And and more so, how did you know that they would respect your values and character and mission? Isn't there a story that I read about you know looking across the table and? looking, uh, I don't know who's negotiating it in the eye and really having a sense. I don't know if that was Erwin. I, I think, you know, as we went through the whole process ar- around sale, I, I liken it a little bit to um, a horse race with, with jumps in it. Um, and and I felt as though there were three jumps that we had to, to do in this race um, and take them in order that were all around the word value. So first of all, it wasn't the value of the company. That was the second jump. The first was the values of which the acquirers we were speaking to um, had and stood by and had evidence that they, you know, that's that's what they really believed in. Do, did any of potential, the potential inquir- uh, acquirers overlap with the way we see the world and how our business could use its position um, to be a force for good and to improve children's lives and the relationship with food? And um, Payne Celestial came through that. You know, it, it, it's an entrepreneurial company. It's built brands that have a purpose. Um, Earth's Best was in its stable, which was which which um, had not dissimilar story from Alice Kitchen, and had been with them for for, for a, a good ten years by the time we were speaking to them, um, and had been successful yet kept its mission. So, so v- values. Um, I, I would recommend anybody who wants to sell a business 
and ensure that its legacy stays or wants to be involved in some way, values first. Second hurdle was value. Obviously, we were very proud that we built a business. We felt it had a value, and we wanted to ensure that we were paid that value um, that we'd helped create. And the third hurdle then was added value. What would the business that acquires us add value? How would they do that? Um, Yes to the bottom line by uh, economies of scale and new markets and new ideas and access to uh, sort of assets that we didn't have before. But also, how would they add value to our culture and our purpose and the impact that we could create um, that wasn't necessarily defined in dollars and cents, but it was defined in improving uh, families' lives? Um, And they were the three jumps then, really. Uh, values, value, and added value, that by the time I felt we'd jumped those three hurdles in our process, uh, Hen Celestial was the business that I felt most comfortable, uh, that really got us, would do all the things that I'd hoped others could ultimately achieve with a partner. Um, and, uh, you know, very happily over five years ago now, uh, became part of the Hen Celestial group. And the sales of the company, I've read that they are almost 200 million around the globe recently? Yeah, they're over $100 million. They're somewhere between uh, those two numbers, um, continuing to grow every year. Um, And, uh, you know, certainly in the UK, going from a startup, you know, on my kitchen table, uh, trying to get our first listing, to within uh, seven years, the biggest, uh, not just organic baby food, but baby food business in the UK. Um, uh, so the UK, which has about 66 million people, um, we have a, a 36% market share, something like that, uh, all baby food sold. Um, and it's in 40 countries uh, uh, around the world. Um, it's got four uh, best-selling uh, cookbooks, um, which, a- again, is um, a revenue stream, yes. It's a uh, branding, uh, you know, it's an ambassador for our brand. But fundamentally, we decided to do cookbooks, which is around scratch cooking, um, which is sort of kind of competitive with, you think you may think of it as, as competitive to selling pre-prepared baby food. We honestly believe that... Um, having an interaction with food, knowing where it comes from, how it's prepared, being involved in the process will make children uh, more susceptible to trying new foods. Um, And therefore, we felt that we should write cookbooks uh, that had fun recipes, that involved games and things with the kids as they wrote wrote shopping lists, visited the store, did some of the cooking, and were proud to to show what they could make with healthy recipes um, that that created four from scratch foods um, and, and not worry about, well, my goodness, if they're doing that and they're not, they're, well, they're not buying our products. Yeah, your, your, your view of having, um, you know, just not being about selling product, but truly about the entire category and education is just marvelous. And it's, it's a very uh, forward thinking attribute for a leader. I have to, again, point our viewers to the the videos you have online, the weenie weaning videos are hysterical because some of the babies, and I'm sure this is true, um, they have more food around their face and on their bibs. I know one of your parents said, you got to have bibs, a lot of bibs. Um, and you had men and women and such. Th- those are just priceless. And so, so they're just terrific. Um, Paul, I'd love to turn to just the, to your book, um, little wins, um, the huge power of thinking like a toddler. And, you know, you say in the book, toddlers see the world differently, act on their instincts and pursue their goals with rigor and determination. Can you, um, give us some insights? Why did you write the book and what can adults, um, what can we learn by growing down versus growing up? Well, as I grew at Ellers and I was increasingly asked to speak uh, more publicly and, and, and be asked questions by people around what, what, you know, what advice would be or what the secret of why we were successful, I, I found myself over the years answering with, you know, you've got to be creative and think of new things or you've got to be honest to yourself and, and, and all the different things, ten- tenacity, um, uh, have confidence in yourself, all of the classic things that people tell entrepreneurs to do. I began to 
overlap them or realize what I was saying was the things I was seeing through our consumers when they came in and tried our food or when we worked with the, the, the close families that we worked with in trying to understand how we could better serve them. Um, and I began to say, to suddenly say, well, actually, the way you can build your best business is to think like a toddler because we, when we develop a new product, we uh, extensively test it with uh, with young children, and they don't mess around in terms of telling you whether they like it or not. If they don't like it, it will be thrown on the floor and up the walls. And if they love it, they will literally shake with excitement and have it all around their mouths and in their mouths and, and really uh, demand for more. And so the so I just took inspiration from from children. Now then I began to think, you know what? I think I am. Yes, I'm gray haired and I'm in my fifties and you know I'm I'm seen by some as as this uh this this business person. Yet what I feel in myself is no different than I felt like when I was a young child and the wonder I have when I see something new and the wonder I saw in my children my own children's eyes when they were little. And I began to listen to their questions and listen to look at the way they interacted with each other and, and, and saw the world. And I thought, my goodness, I, I'm glad I've got a little bit of that. I think it's what helped create Ellis Kitchen and made it different. But I wish I had more. Um, and uh, so my book really says we were all the best version of ourselves that we were ever is when we were three, four and five years old. When we were at that age, we had just learned how to smile and to walk and to talk and to play. And we'd learned a whole load of skills in that very short two or three year period from being you know, a baby that cries and can't move to being an articulate toddler who can ask questions about how the world is and why it is, can run around and explore the world, and can learn so much every single day um, and take no nothing for, for granted or, or the rules for granted. And it, it all sort of envelops in, in a creativity that they have that I think we're sorely lacking in our world now. I take a lot of inspiration in the book from um, the, most, the person that's uh, given the most ever watched TED Talk, which is a British guy called Sir Ken Robinson, who, whose TED Talk oh, yes, was uh, Do Schools Kill Creativity? And um, other research that he's done shows that when, when, when you take a three or four or five year old, um, the, the, they can fundamentally think divergently. And that's how they think. That's how they get through their days, thinking divergently, moving from concentrating on one thing to another, to another, to another. And it is a li literally a measure of creativity. Now, 98% of us, when we were three, four or five, thought divergently and therefore were creative in our day-to-day -day lives. By the time we get to 25 years old, only 2% of the population thinks uh, divergently day-to-day -day and therefore creatively. So only 2% of us are, are, are using creativity at 25, and I'm sure it gets uh, less as the older you get. Yet 98% of us were creative when we were five. So the world has lost creativity from 96% of the population. And I just feel as if, if instead of 2% of us retaining that creativity, if 4% of us could, that will double the amount of creativity in the world the number of ideas in the world, the number of businesses that can create prosperity, the number of solutions that we can have to the social and environmental problems that we've got. And we, and it, it doesn't seem that, that, that hard if we could change the way we parent and educate in our corporate system was for only 96% of us to uh, lose creativity uh, rather than 98% uh, of us. I, I just love that. And I would suggest this book to anybody. Um, you know, I love Built to Last, but I'm going to put this one by, by Collins, but I'm going to put this one right next to that. And I love as one of your endorsements. It's from Lord Hastings, who's just amazing. Um, he's global head of citizenship at KPMG. And he says, in an uncertain and fast changing world, little wins can show why the timeless simplicity of a young child's perspective can transform the way we live and work. A compelling case for innovation. And as companies today are just looking for the newest ideas and ways to innovate, um, growing down is, is a marvelous and kind of, uh, you know, counter way to thinking uh, only the adults have the answers. You talked about B Corp and uh, there's a really funny but simple video on the website that talks about B Corp's 
with pictures of bees and it's, it's, it's very literal. Um, can you just uh, briefly share, you know, why Ella's became a B Corp, why the B Corp movement is important today? Yeah, I'll start with kind of what, what a B Corp is. And, you know, it, it's, um, a, a, it's a pioneering company who, who really is seeking to change the definition of what success is in business. Um, it is uh, a business that is, has taken a stance and changed its constitution, taking, ch- changed its articles of association and its constitution documents to move away from its point is the primacy of shareholder returns and maximizing shareholder returns to saying, no, our point is to optimize stakeholder returns. We have as much responsibility to the environment and to people as we do to profit. They are all equally important to us. We want to build a business that creates profit, but not at the expense of people or the environment. And um, uh, the movement launched in the last decade, there are um, over 2,000 uh, B corporations in existence now. Alice Kitchen is really proud to be one of the first in the UK, joins a band of um, variety of, of different companies from from very small um, entrepreneurially led, completely mission focused companies to very established, huge companies like Danone and Unilever, public companies that have found a way to uh, 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 register and, and, and accredit their subsidiaries and in some cases the, the overall organization um, to, to be a B Corporation. That I, I'm, I, I can see from the growth of B Corps across uh, the world, I can see from the growth of other mission-led businesses that, that, um, that they're successful. I know in the UK where the food industry grows by half a percentage um, point um, uh, a, a year, uh, B corporations are growing by fourteen percent, and that's the same. As, and it's not these tiny, just these tiny companies that are that are growing. It's big, big companies like Unilever Brands and, and like Danone itself. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I think what you know, as I spoke a little bit earlier about the evolution of capitalism. I think it, it is happening because. The young generation that are coming through that are the key employees, the key innovators and entrepreneurs, and already the majority of consumers around the world and the consumer purchasing power that they have, they are demanding that from the companies, that they act um, in a way that is responsible, is sustainable, and lives with the values that that generation has. Terrific. So um, as we unfortunately have to wind this down, um, what's next for Paul Lindley? I know that you're, um, you've, you've left um, um, Hain Celestial, you, you had the role of chairman uh, for Ella's, and you're doing some really exciting things. So I'd love you for our listeners to, to tell them what is your purpose, and then what are you doing that's, what's next for you? You know, I, I talked a lot about having a mission um, for business and having a purpose for a business, and I've self-reflected about, well, what is, what is my personal one? And and, you know, I've just got this belief that we can build communities and businesses and societies that are richer in opportunity, in compassion and in ideas. And that's when I kind of work that out. We, we've got the capacity as people to increase the opportunities for other people, the compassion for other people um, and the ideas that we can generate to improve our world. And I thought they... This can fundamentally happen through business, which is the only mechanism that we've got to create prosperity that can pay for some of these ideas. Um, and, I, and so I wanted, I, I gave myself the opportunity to uh, free my time and my thinking and uh, uh, up to get involved in a wider number of things than just uh, the business that I created. Um, and uh, so now I'm trying to do those things through um, through social businesses and social enterprises. So, uh, for example, I'm an investor I'm on the board of a, a business called Toast Ale, which is craft beer, fantastic, delicious craft beer. But in each bottle, there is a slice of a fresh uh, surplus bread. Um, and, uh, you know, the whole ethos of the company is that uh, we've got a food waste problem in this world, that the majority of that food waste is uh, it, it comes from uh, bread that's not eaten. 44% of the bread that's baked in the United States today will not be eaten. It will be thrown away. 
So if we can get that bread before while it's before it, it, it's thrown away, while it's still fresh, um, and we can take it and, and make beer from it um, and uh, recycle it into the supply chain again. And then if we can take all the profits from the business that we've created by doing adding the value of a cr- great uh, product, uh, giving the value of great employment and, and, and love and learning and legacy leaving um, of the employees, um, and we can make profits, we dedicate those profits back to uh, a, a charity that addresses um, food waste. And we've even found a unique way of um, encouraging investors to invest for good uh, with something called equity for good that we've got, where investors pledge that all the upside that they get from their investment that they will dedicate to good, whether that's in uh, uh, social impact investing or charity giving. It's up to them, but we um, have scaled our first series of uh, investment uh, around uh, 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 people that, that want to invest that way. So that's in business. I'm also uh, a trustee and on the board of Sesame Workshop, um, which is an iconic 50 years old next year uh, media company, obviously, that is right at the heart of uh, American childhood and increasingly around the world childhood. And then uh, out of business, I've tried to use business principles and entrepreneurial principles, risk taking, creativity, uh, thinking like a toddler. Uh, and, and not in the box. Um, in areas uh, like I've, uh, I chair London's Child Obesity Task Force, which the Mayor of London appointed me to, um, to look at ways where we can address this really significant problem in, in, in the UK and in London specifically, where 40% of our young people are either overweight or obese already. And it's highly um, uh, poverty uh, skewed. And what can we do about the environment in London? That we can change, and part of it will be um, encouraging entrepreneurs to come in with um, healthier businesses that ser- serve healthier options, or use technology in a way that can help people live their lives um, uh, uh, more healthy, uh, as, as well as changing infrastructure and uh, uh, advertising um, opportunities and things to, 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 to nudge our society to a healthier lifestyle. I'm using entrepreneurial skills there, so I have a varied, very, very, uh, varied life, but. Um, you know, I fundamentally believe that individuals can make differences, that we can make little ripples all over the place. And when a few ripples come together, they start to create a wave and waves can, you know, break down, um, break down uh, the status quo and, and bring great change. Um, and, uh, you know, I believe, as I've said already through my book, Little Wins, that the ideas that we need to make the changes that we have to have to create a better society are already there. Um, it's finding them. It's for having 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 the courage to to see them through. Uh, you know, the future is already here. With uh, uh, one of my heroes, Professor Muhammad Yunus, um, is uh, one of the founders of social enterprise. Um, you know, he he he's got a great quote about um, the the future is already here. It's just hidden. You know that that the, there will be an idea somewhere in the world today that if by design or chance. Um, gets found, um, it can quickly be used to scale whether, where, you know, change, whether that's impact change for individual people's lives or it's, um, you know, monetary change and in, in, in scaling a, a business. Um, most ideas are already there, you know, and, and, and Silicon Valley is great proof of, you know, how in a generation um, little ideas can become world leading um businesses and you know fundamentally change the way we operate as people so that is you're doing so many rich things and um i know that ella's will always um be in your heart your daughter now ella is what 17 she's 19 is that about she's how, 19 she's 19 okay and I'm and I'm sure that you're going to want um as i there's another cone when i sold cone so i always um you know, encourage them to do the best research because my name's out there all the time. So I certainly understand. Um, in closing, Paul, where can people get more information? Well, if they're interested in the things I'm involved with and why I'm involved with them and the, the impact that they make, that those things are making, then I have a website, which is paullindley.uk. When I look back, you know, one of the most singularly changing few minutes of my life was when I... Um, came across a marriage certificate from my great-great-grandparents who were married 
uh, just over 100 years before I was born. And I was so pleased to find this. And I found they were farmers and they were in a rural part of England and I got their names and how old they were. And then I saw how they uh, signed their marriage certificate with X's because neither of them could read or write just 100 years before I was born. And I just thought, what opportunities did they miss out from? What ideas did they never get to see it in their brains or if they did to see through because they couldn't um, communicate or read or learn? Um, how many jobs didn't they find because they couldn't find a way to find that job that they love? Um, and, you know, I, I look at myself, I can see their children. I've seen photographs of their children who look like me, their sons that look like me. And I just so, so clearly can relate to the fact that I've just lucked out in, in, in being born at the right time and taken the opportunities that I had. And how many other people around the world do, 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 are, are, are prevented for whatever reason from maximizing the opportunities that they had? And that, that's such a, a loss for individual lives, but it's a massive loss for our countries and our societies and the communities that we live in. Um, and so what drives me every day is kind of climbing new mountains and not believing that the the, the a repository of ideas in the world is limited. It is unlimited. We don't. Uh, what is limited is our time and our and ability, you know, and therefore our, our focus. And you know, if we can each pick things to focus on, dedicate our time to it, we'll enrich our own lives. We'll enrich the society that we live in, and we can do that through business and business principles in other areas. And that's what I get out of bed. For every day, that optimism that um, that, that we're not done yet, um, and uh, that an idea that I hear today, I can encourage people to uh, amplify, and it may be the thing that um, changes uh, the way that our, our, our societies live. Well, well, that's fantastic, and perhaps by growing down um, and you know using uh, thinking to be like they were a toddler. That's one great way to come up with amazing ideas. I have to say, I'm going to thank you so much for this interview. Um, I always had um, Paul Pullman and I had Howard Schultz at the top of my list as uh, purpose-driven leaders. And now I just like to say that you are right there, up there with them, Paul. I so encourage our listeners to really um, spend time on your website, read your book, check out Ella's, all the incredible branding that was done, um, the great go-to-market strategies, because Paul Lindley is certainly one of our great um, you know, purpose-driven leaders. And I know that I'm going to hear, we're all going to hear in probably one, two, or three years, your next Ella's and your next great contribution. So thank you very much. And I'd like to end and ask everyone listening, what is your purpose?